Hi everyone, Dr. Jay Mehta from Mumbai. In this video, we are going to try and understand the very basics of genetics which we need to understand for practicing fertility as well as for gynecology. The reason why I'm using the words gynecology and obstetrics is because very soon these tests are going to find applications across the entire spectrum of fertility and gynecology. All right. So let us just understand the basics of this entire genetics, what we need to know. So whenever we try to do this, what are we trying to actually look into? We are trying to look into the DNA, correct? Now, this is something that we all know, but we have completely forgotten. This is our normal DNA structure, which is a double helical structure, correct? Now, this is normally formed of two strands, correct? That is all that we know. So, these strands, na, they are going to be opening up like this whenever they want to code any genes, correct? Na? Now, one of the strand out here is a coding strand. The other strand is a non-coding strand, correct? So, this is something which we have to practically understand and remember all right now what do we also have simultaneously we have 22 pairs of autosomes and we have one pair of sex chromosomes correct very very simple that is why we end up talking as 46 xx or 46 xy all right so I'm going to just brush up through the basics, okay? The absolute basics of testing, the absolute basics of terminologies, which we need to understand. What are our typical cases where we are going to need any form of evaluation, okay, of genetics are going to be standardly in patients who are having a suspected genetic abnormality, correct? So that is our cases where we are suspecting anything, it can be Klinefelter syndrome, it can be Turner syndrome, which comes in pediatric gynecology, it can be recurrent pregnancy losses, it can be Carter-Jenner syndrome, which affects a lot of gynac patients as far as mobility and motility of cilia is concerned. And it can be varied other things which we need to look into. Correct? So one is a genetic abnormality, where we suspect anything. Correct? Second is pregnancy loss. We all know this thing. When we have multiple first trimester losses, we can have pregnancy loss where we are indicating it for the couple as well as for the expelled fetus, correct? For both these conditions, we are going to look into genetics as far as this is concerned. Third, when I look and when I consider fertility, predominantly when I look at fertility, we are looking at genetics when it comes to doing embryo testing, correct? That is one and obviously we are also doing karyotyping of the couple in order to establish any genetic causes and you know multiple things we have PGT, PGM, PGS. I'm going to talk about all these things in a little while and finally we have fetal medicine. All these are parts of our obstetrics. Okay, so fetal and obstetric where we are going to look at NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing. We are going to look at amniocentesis, correct. We are going to have fetal biopsies and in all these things, we are going to need some or the other form of genetic evaluation. So the commonest confusion which we have is what test to send, what to tell, because normally when we have people coming over representing any of these genetics laboratories, they try to talk in terminologies, which probably we don't understand. And even if we think we don't understand, we have to pretend that we understand these terminologies, correct? So let us go into the absolute basics of all these things. So first, let me tell you, predominantly, the samples which we need now, when it comes to adult evaluation or when it comes to evaluation of the couple, irrespective of the test which we need to do, it is usually going to be peripheral blood. All right. Usually it is going to be peripheral blood. Simultaneously, if you are looking into oncology, okay, now oncology samples is predominantly going to be tissue or if it is heritable, or if it is a heritable cause, then again, it is going to be peripheral blood. All right. Again, very, very important for you to understand this. When we look at fertility and embryo, it is not peripheral blood. It is actually troph ectoderm. Okay. So these are the three, four important points, which we need to consider as far as what type of sample we need to send. 
and where we need to send the sample, right? So let me just break up these tests into things where we can probably try and give you some understanding. So the first thing which I'm going to write down here is actually karyotyping. All right, karyotyping, then I'm going to write down microarray. All right, now after microarray, I'm going to write down exome sequencing. Okay, and after that, I'm going to write down genome sequencing. Theek hai? So both these things are important. Like how do we normally call this as whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing? Correct. We also request for microarray procedures in lot of cases and we also request for our standard karyotyping. So standard karyotyping, please remember all these na, karyotyping predominantly is going to detect a particular size beyond that size, matlab any size smaller than that karyotyping is not going to help. That means any spectrum of DNA which you want to study which is smaller than that size, then you will not be able to apply standard karyotyping to that, right? Again, so what is important is karyotyping predominantly is going to occur on peripheral blood. That is something which is important. So we are trying to look into the lymphocytes and the DNA which we extract is then amplified obviously. All right, all of this undergoes a process of amplification and what is it best useful for? So we have this DNA arranged like this, you know, we all know this. So all chromosomes are sort of arranged in this manner when we look at our karyotyping reports, nahi? All of them are arranged in this manner. So what is it predominantly going to help us understand? See, it will help us understand if there is a defect. Okay, if there is a defect in number. That is important. So when we look at defect in number, that means we are predominantly looking at trisomy, monosomy, all these things. Simultaneously, it is going to help us understand translocations. Very, very simple. No? Chromosome A... Do in so three ka one part became in one one ka one part became in three we need a geneticist who is going to tell us are are there is a balanced translocation unbalanced translocation short arm has gone long arm has gone jo kuch bhi hai. understanding apart from all these things when we look it will also help us understand if there is any specific major deletion hai na? if there is any specific major deletion then your standard karyotyping is going to help you now, when your standard karyotyping fails, that means you think, no, I do not think my standard karyotyping will help me in this particular situation. Then you switch to microarrays. But just remember one thing. When you are looking at peripheral bloods and lymphocytes, this is actually live tissue. Huh? So you cannot do karyotyping unless you have live tissue. The advantage of microarrays is you can even do it on dead tissue. Huh? That is a big advantage. You can do it on dead tissue but contamination is a problem all right so that is very very important so predominantly we request for microarray testings when we want to look into fetal testing right when we are looking at fetal testing okay now microarray also goes through its own set of amplification and it also goes through a process of separation all right now once that happens only then the further testing on a microarray chip happens. Okay, it is a chip based thing. Do not get into the uh, actual thing. Okay, that you know what chip is used and how it is used and all these things. But remember, microarray is always going to be slightly better as compared to karyotyping when you want to look at certain specific information as far as the gene is concerned. Correct, as far as the DNA is concerned. Now then we come to these final two things which keep on irritating us. What is whole exome sequencing and what is whole genome sequencing? See, remember, when I draw a DNA for you, no? let me just draw this DNA again. All right, inside this DNA, you are going to have certain parts only which are coding for genes. So for example, if I draw this DNA, there is one part number one which codes for a gene. There is this part number two which codes for a gene. Let's assume. Correct? Just follow this very carefully. So the part which codes for the gene, the gene coding parts, okay, the gene coding region is actually called as exome, okay, that is called as exome. So when you want to look at only the protein coding regions of a gene, that is called as exome sequencing, correct? 
in this what typically happens from your live tissue out of this dna all this unwanted dna which is present no see this is unwanted no yeah unwanted this is this guy is unwanted that is unwanted so all that unwanted tissue is actually taken out and only the exomes remain and these exomes are then further processed basically okay variety of technology so the best platform which people use these days is something called as ngs that is something called as next generation sequencing there are machines to do these things there are kits available based on what you want to test so that is something which you must understand what is whole genome sequencing then see whole genome sequencing means you do not want only the exomic region if this is the entire gene and these are the regions number 1 and number 2 which are coding for proteins you don't care about it you just want this entire genome to be sequenced correct even that is tested on next generation sequencing correct please remember both these procedures exome and genome sequencing predominantly for our knowledge we should remember that these are costly procedures but in my humble opinion this cost is now going to go down subsequently substantially over the next 5 years because ngs is picking up hugely in the field of genetics is concerned which we need to understand and what's going to happen is sooner or later the cost of these tests is going to become ridiculously inexpensive all right and that is when it's going to be massively advantageous to all of us correct please remember this thing that definitely ngs next generation sequencing it has its has its own machine to amplify and it has its own kit and all these things now that is something which is becoming the gold standard as far as genetics in obstetrics gynecology oncology fertility is concerned all right this is going to become the standard of care so this is just something which we must remember predominantly when we are looking at pre implantation genetic screening so i'll just explain that part in a very little and a very quick manner a lot of times non ivf consultants are very worried about this so what is pgta what is pgtm and then what is pgs all right so pgs is simple pgs stands for pre implantation genetic screening okay this is genetic screening so you want to screen the entire embryo this is something which where you want to screen the entire genome of that embryo which is sequenced on next generation sequencing okay and you are going to have information if the am- embryo is euploid if the embryo ha- is mosaic or if the embryo is aneuploid very very simple correct so what you want to transfer inside the patient is basically a euploid embryo where there is no detectable gross abnormality on next generation sequencing that is what you want to transfer correct pgta is basically a testing which helps in detection of aneuploid embryos only okay this is something which is helpful in detecting of aneuploid embryos standard pgta testing for embryos has no role okay it is should not be done as a standard even for old patients okay for elderly patients as well should not be done correct pgtm is something interesting where it helps you in detecting single gene defects it is again very simple the single gene defect is identified from the couple who undergo a whole genome or exome sequencing a probe is matched and that probe is applied over this embryo where you can understand which embryo is euploid or which embryo is a carrier very very simple very very simple in this okay no major rocket science but remember all the three pgta pgtm and pgts all the three can only be done on an embryo with a troph ectoderm biopsy you need to be very careful in doing this procedure you need a lot of expertise to do this procedure sooner or later you are going to have nipt that means non invasive testing all right even in embryos all right where you are going to collect the fluid surrounding the embryo so where you are going to collect the culture media surrounding the embryos okay culture media of typically day 5 embryos because these embryos also give out certain proteins which leak out and you are going to amplify those proteins and then do it so that there is no risk of embryo injury okay but then this thing is currently not equivalent as far as biopsy is concerned 
the standardization is not that good at the moment but i think in the next five years even that's going to go so trough ectoderm biopsy is going to completely disappear and just with peripheral culture fluid you will be able to detect all these problems as far as next generation sequencing for embryos is concerned right so i hope as a part of this master class you've understood all the basics of genetics which we need to understand i'm going to take sessions where we are going to have really detailed information about all these things because i really like to study this and uh, as a disclaimer i would be investing into genetics very soon as a part of my future capex so that is something which really interests me and i hope all of you have found this lecture useful any more questions you can post and we'll be happy to answer thank you so much friends we are available for consulting in bombay indore ahmedabad and bangalore bombay is our primary location all appointment numbers are mentioned in the description if anyone is genuinely interested they may contact the hospitals for the same